So, but stories, when I was thinking about this, and I have lots of stories to tell, and I won't get through them all because I'm not going to read 35 pages to you. <laughs> Promise. Um, it just occurred to me this morning, really. And I, you know, I, my whole career, I have taught off a post-it note. And I almost never use it. I, I had a teacher in college who took role one day, opened his notebook, and read it for the entire semester. On the last day, he closed it and said, class dismissed. He taught me something, though. I don't want to teach that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured, when I need notes, it's time to retire. I'm kind of getting there, <laughs> right? <laughs> I need notes. So, but this morning, it occurred to me that I wanted to really put this in the idea of act one, act two, and act three. And as I was thinking about that and looking at my notes and thinking, okay, how, is act, how am I going to look at act one? And then I realized everything about this college is act one. The hardest thing is act one. For a writer, it is the hardest thing. For someone who's writing an essay, the introduction, the thesis, all of that is the hardest thing. It's the thing you keep going back to and keep rewriting and keep doing over and over again because everything in the middle sort of, and then you go back and you go, oh, wait, that's not right. And then you look at it and you go, oh, the direction of everything else is wrong because this is right. And boy, act one is everything. And we are act one for our students. Act one for our students. You know, I have a, probably going to annoy the administration a little bit here. It's OK. They'll, they, they're good with it. I don't like mission statements. My idea of hell is where I have to eternally write mission statements. Oh. I, when I first came here, we had a mission statement that I've always remembered. I, I couldn't recite the one we have now. It's something about thriving and evolving. Those are the only two words I can remember. But the mission statement was not really a mission statement, which is why I remember it. And it was, we are a community of learners, open to all. So what kind of statement is that? It's an identity statement. We are a community of learners open to all. I don't need to know more. That's all I need to know. If I know who I am, I always know what to do. When I forget who I am, I don't do what I'm really needing to do. So, the idea of being a community is not easy. And at a community college, it's a commuter college even when people are here, right, physically. So where does the community happen? The only place the community can happen is in our classroom and with each other. That's it. That's our whole opportunity right there, that moment. You know, and for some, you know, like when Patrick is teaching theater, that's quite a community. That's a messy, messy community. Beautifully, elegantly messy. So we're always in Act One. Act One is where you think you know who you are. And then something happens. And you have to think about, who am I now? Wait, what am I in the face of this? This thing? Whatever it might be. For our students, a lot of them, it's for moving into adulthood, especially right now with all these running start students. You're 18. Maybe you're 16. And you're not even quite thinking this yet. Or maybe you're more like me a person who dropped out of college and came back to college. And that's, that's a do-over. That's a who am I now in the face of this. So I don't have an action plan. I have a sort of stunned gaze as that person, as do our students, and as we also have with each other sometimes, right? We don't know each other that well. I'm going to tell you a few stories today you don't know about me. 
you know, I'm going to come out of the closet. Oh, wait, I did that already. <laughs> I have more closets. <laughs> right? I have more closets. Um, so I'm going to start, and, and I'm a very private person, generally speaking. And those of you who've known me for a long time probably know that because you're going, I don't really know that much about her. But, <laughs> but I'm an introvert, always have been an introvert. Uh, so I'm going to tell some stories about myself, and I'm going to start, and this is really a bad way to start, but I'm going to start really with being a kid, a little kid. When I was a kid, we lived in Berkeley when I was born. Spent 43 years of my life within a five-mile radius of Berkeley until I moved here. There was a year I lived in Texas, so I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I have lots of family in Texas. but. I briefly went to college in Texas, and I left. Um, we moved from Berkeley to a house, and the Bay Area in the 1950s was nothing like what you picture it now. There were trees everywhere. There was space. There was parking. <laughs> you know, I'm watching this area now become what it was in terms of population and all, maybe in the 1970s. It, it, where it started really kicking in the growth. Um, and now you can't even find a parking space any place in the Bay Area. But we moved five miles out of uh, Berkeley into an area where they were building new homes, and it was a cow patch. And so it was, there were literally cows across the street in this new house. I loved it. My mother hated it. She loved Berkeley. She didn't know how to drive. She loved walking everywhere, taking buses, right? And so for me, I, my favorite thing, this was before I even started kindergarten, was to go down to the creek. She didn't like me to do this, but go down to the creek. And at this mossy creek, there was the oak trees, and, the, and the, the trees had moss going up. And I would just go down there in my red galoshes, and I would just play with the tree frogs. And I would let them crawl over my arms. And these poor things are all extinct now. Right? So, when I tell you a story like this, you're time traveling with me. Because I can do that because I'm old, right? Ish. <laughs> right? Oldish, right? And when whatever world you're from, right, wherever you've come from, whatever experiences you have, when you tell me your stories, I'm traveling with you. And, you know, it's, this is a lot better than airlines to travel with each other. So, I loved this. I would go down there and I would play with the tadpoles, and we had lots of frogs, you know, that would croak all night, and the ones, the little bitty ones that would crawl up your arm. And then I had to go to school. Right? 1958, I have to go to school. So I go to school, and I have to wear a dress. Forget the galoshes. <laughs> so there I am at school, and I just hate it, and I have to stay inside all day. I lived outside as a kid. And so now I'm inside all day. And it's just boring. It's awful. I come home and finally I say, Mom, I, I just can't, can't wear dresses every day. And so she relents at one point, because I'm just that persistent, and lets me wear pants. They send me home. I want you to know my senior class in high school, we still had to wear dresses. I graduated in 1972, one year before Roe v. Wade. And there was no Title IX, forget that, <laughs> right? So in this moment, I learned something. I'm four years old. I learned about sexism. And I learned about the confinement of systems. It only got worse from there. I went on through all the K through 12. And I, half the time, I didn't know what they were talking about. And I was locked in rooms. It was sunny out. I was locked in rooms. And I didn't, I didn't feel like this was my place. These were not my people. This was not my story. This was not my community. So this went on until I got to seventh grade. And, and I've got to step back a second. And if you know I love librarians, you know this about me. The saving grace in K through 12 for me was librarians. 
because they would read stories to us. And everything would just shut down. And suddenly, we had the oldest librarian I ever saw in my life. <laughs> she was probably my age. <laughs> I, she looked to me at the time like she was 90 years old. Right? But she would read stories about treasure and going to sea. And I was always off on the sea again, you know, on these boats and ships. And I was traveling. Sometimes I was time traveling. You know, we love history, right, David? And so we love to do that. So I thank God for the librarians. They never graded. They never assessed. <laughs> they never judged. They gave you stories in the open sea. I love them. I still love them. Then I had a teacher who taught me reading. And that is the best teacher of all. That is the most important teacher of all teachers in the world, the one that can teach you to read. And she used to read Stuart Little out loud to us. Again, I'm, like, I'm in a story. I'm somewhere else. Right. Then I got to seventh grade. That was junior high school where I was. And I, I, miraculously, I walk into a classroom, and there's this teacher. And she's not 100 years old. She's, <laughs> she's in a miniskirt. And she drives a red Carmen Ghia. And she just got back from the Peace Corps. And I have her for two blessed hours a day. And she teaches poetry and English. And then after that hour's over, she teaches us Spanish. The only Spanish I ever learned was from her. Because what we had was television sets. And you would repeat sentences back to the television set. And suddenly, I had a person who actually spoke Spanish. She was like, who could explain it and could slow down. And so throughout all that time, I had been put in slow learner classes. This is where I'm coming out okay? from time to time. It's like, oh, just put you are in a slow learner class. But Miss Rivia, there she is, you know, and she's, she's wonderful. We have the class clown in that two hour section. <laughs> and God bless her, she laughed. You know, he was funny. We all laughed. <laughs> He later went on and got a rock band. <laughs> so, so it was a blessed year. I came back at the beginning of eighth grade. Oh, by the way, she started a club. It's the only club I ever belonged to. Myself and one other person, Peter and I, were in this club, and it was a storytelling club. Are you surprised? <laughs> right. And so what we did, we're 12 years old or something, she would drive us in her red Carmen Ghia, right, to the elementary schools, and we would sit and t tell stories to the elementary school kids. This is a shy, not just introverted, but shy person. I love this. I came back in eighth grade, and I went to the secretary, the school secretary, and I said, where's Miss Revia? I know we didn't have her for a teacher. And she said, oh, they fired her. She couldn't keep discipline in her classroom. She couldn't keep order. They assigned me to an English teacher who hated us, just hated us. She was grumpy, never smiled. She had an ashtray on her desk. I mean, it was hideous. And at that point, I lost all hope for the educational system. It was just hopeless. <clears throat> Throughout my high school, my mother, who was really truly one of the smartest people I ever knew, she couldn't afford to go to college, neither could my dad. Uh, she always wanted to be a medical doctor, and <laughs> she dated a few med medical students along the way. Her idea of a good date was going to see the cadavers, really. I mean, she had medical books. She, she could recite the bones in the body until a week before she died the most obscure bones. But I would be so oppressed in the educational system that there were times I just went to the nurse's office and I said, I have a sore throat. They called my mom and she came get me to get me. So she came and got me and she would take me to lunch and we would talk about all manners of philosophical things. <laughs> and I, there I was learning and I was learning to be a teacher by the way. 
because my mother loved to talk about anything intelligent. She did not have any patience whatsoever for suburban women who wanted to go to cocktail parties and brag about their husbands. She, was, she didn't understand that world at all. But she never said a thing to me. She just took me to lunch. So when I graduated from high school, it was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> I was paroled from a life <laughs> sentence <laughs> and free to travel. Of course, I ended up going off to college for a year. And when I was at college, I took some of those exams you have to take, the ACTs. I never took the SATs, I took the ACTs. And I tested higher than they'd ever gotten for history. But I wouldn't major in it, because every time you walked into a history class, all they talked about was generals <laughs> and wars. And I, you know that? 60 song, ain't gonna study war no more. That was kind of where I was at with history. So I did five different majors in a little short time there. Uh, cultural anthropology <coughs> was one of them. That got closest maybe. But I couldn't dig up dead people. That was the other part. <laughs> My mother was not having that either. It's like, no, no, you do not disturb the dead. So. I went off to college, I dropped out of college, and I went into business. And I was in the corporate world for 10 years. And I love to talk about that. It has nothing to do with what we do here. Honestly, it does not. Business is business. I love business. I especially love small business. Large corporations give me the heebie-jeebies. But they're also not really very good at business. If you own your own business, you're good at business. You have to be good at business. It's your money, it's your life. And I, I was with Nordstrom for a decade. I was in my 20s. I was probably pretty much from 20 to 30. I made as much money then with my high school diploma as I was hired at here. And that was the 70s and that, this is the 90s. So it wasn't the money. But I, I was introverted, and I needed a job, so I ended up in commission sales. So how does that work? <laughs> I mean, really commission sales. If you don't make your, your sort of quota, they fire you. And you have three months to absolutely hit it and never fall out of it again. So this was a learning curve for me. So I'm going to tell you some stories. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is race and religion. because. You know, bless my mother, there was nothing she wouldn't talk about. And I've been that way as a teacher. And I will stumble through anything and be awkward with it, but I will always talk about whatever you want to talk about. And be glad for the conversation. So, <clears throat> the 70s, I did not invent them. We're talking early 70s, and I'm, I'm on the floor, and I'm, I'm in footwear, which you know sounds terrible, you sell shoes. I'm in footwear, and, but that's like the movie stars of Nordstrom. That's where you make the most money, and you're like the hero. And the Nordstroms themselves, it was like they would do it. They would get on, they, the CEOs would come out and do it. Uh, which, by the way, administration, I really have this just inkling to get you all back in the classroom. <laughs> I do. I think it would be good for all of us. But in the fall, when it's really busy, that'd be kind of a good thing. But so I watched the people that had been there long, a long time, and thought, OK, how do they do this? And it was an open floor, so you could go up to anybody you want. And I learned a lot of lessons about race and gender and, all, and economics just by watching commission salespeople because they target people specific to what is going to give them the highest commission. So there are certain people they don't want to wait on. They didn't want to wait on Asians. Why did you not want to wait on Asians, I thought? Because they always want money off. They're always asking for a bargain. Well, I thought, okay, you don't want to wait on Asians. 
they all wanted to wait on black people. Why do you want to wait on black people? Because nobody will give them credit, and they're going to pay cash, and they won't get declined. So you won't lose the commission because you won't lose the sale. That stayed true until about 1980s, that black people could not get credit cards. And there were a few stores that forwarded them some credit just to develop a sort of clientele of black customers. <clears throat> so I thought about this and I thought, okay, well, black customers, sure, who, who doesn't want cash? You know, I'm all for that. And, but Asian customers, what's your problem? And I just was watching, I think, you're just smart, you're asking for a discount. So I started then waiting on any Asian that walked in the door. Because, and what I found out was, yeah, they wanted a discount and occasionally I could give them one. That's just smart, that's just a cultural sort of thing. And, a, I, and what I realized is they never brought anything back. And they always came back to me. People didn't want to wait on people who had weird sizes. And I thought, OK, I'll do that. And they became my clientele. And I started, I, they were fast. The people that I was working with were all really fast. And I was really slow, because you know I'm a slow, slow learner, right? So I'm slow. So I spend time with people. And in the process of spending time with people, I find out about people. I listen to people. And so I know that they came in for one thing, but they've got this other thing going on in their life. And I know there's something that might be right for them. And I start having multiple sales, multiple sales, multiple. I was selling a whole bunch of stuff by slowing down. <laughs> and the stuff I was selling wasn't coming back. I had people who had weird sizes, and I'd call them up and say, I have your size. Or I don't have this, but I'm going to bring you everything I have in that weird size. Right? A, a 10 AAA or something. Really hard to find stuff. Nine and a half narrows. And <clears throat> what I found out is that you know, that's fine if the other salespeople want to do that. But I can't be them. I can only be me. And so I have to do me. That's an identity question. If I know who I am, I know what to do. I don't just imitate other people. So I became a manager for Nordstrom. Um, went in my 20s. I was supervising 30 people. I was uh, operating a, a department that was, you know, I don't really remember. I think it was around 8 or 10 million, something like that. It's hard to know. because. And then I was working really hard, and I had somehow in my life become a yuppie. I was driving a BMW 320i, and I was a yuppie. Who knew this was going to happen? Kid of the 60s, right? But I was getting burned out. Because Nordstrom opened a store that was their pilot store in the Bay Area. And I was a manager when they opened it. And there's a long story I wrote out. I'm not going to tell it to you, other than to say that night before it opened, there were I served a lot of wine to very rich people. And <clears throat> there was a fashion show. And in the fashion show, there, it was something else. Something like, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it before since. They, they brought in all this fish from the Northwest, and they had wine, and they had these models. And I'm in the bathroom with the, the models at some point. And they're really tall. And they're really emaciated, because they're naked. You know, This is seeing the emperor with no clothes. And they come out, you know, emaciated people make really good hangers, <laughs> which is why they, and they're tall. And they, but they're not strong. They're tall, but they're not strong. And that's the illusion that's being sold, the story that's being told right, with this. So they're in these great outfits. And they come out, not like Moonshadow here. The tallest one comes out with a leopard on a leash to the song, Putting on the Ritz. <laughs> and so here, here is, because I've seen them naked, I know that they would more likely be the prey of the leopard if the leopard was probably drugged, I'm assuming, 
wasn't if the leopard was not drugged. But it's all fantasy, it's all illusion. And I was working 80 hours a week and all of that stuff that yuppies do. And I kind of started getting burned out, but I was still upwardly mobile. But then I kept seeing all of the women get fired and all the men get promoted. I saw all but three women get fired in nine months. And guys starting to hire their buddies and promote their buddies. And the corporation had become larger and they couldn't keep their eye on it in the same way they had. And this is what happens to systems when they become large. With the very best intentions, they lose their identity. And they end up latching on to the identity of a drugged leopard and an emaciated woman. And so <clears throat> I was having a lot of second thoughts, but I was still very much involved in it and still thinking I would be upwardly mobile until one night. I happened to have a day off, which was a rare thing. I would work 28 days straight. I had to work 80 hours a week, because yuppies do that. And I was in my 20s and stupid. <laughs> but I had this day off, and I was coming home. It was 10 o'clock at night. I was on a windy road that had a cliff on one side and a hill on the other. And I saw headlights coming straight at me, and a driver driving in the wrong lane coming straight at me. In a split second, I thought, OK, I can either get in the wrong lane, and if he corrects, he's going to knock me off the cliff, cliff, or I can get closer to the hillside. And in the process, maybe he'll correct and we'll be in better shape. And he followed me like a beam up against the hillside. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be dead in two minutes. I'm going to be dead in two minutes. And I don't know why I just got relaxed. I heard the sound of the two cars colliding. At, and he was going about 60, so this should tell you something. He was driving a Chevy Impala, and I had my 320i BMW, because my yuppie car. And I heard the sound, and then all of a sudden, I was in the most amazing place where all of the contradictions of life existed. And they made perfect sense. I started hearing a voice, really soft voice, and I was not paying attention to it, just as like an annoyance. And it got louder and louder. And it was the firefighter, and he kept saying, get out of the car before it blows up. So the door was stuck. I really don't know how I got out of the car. The next thing I remember, I am sitting on the asphalt, bleeding, thinking to myself, I really must write. And knowing that I would quit my job and leave the relationship I was in. I didn't think it, I knew it. Within a couple of months, all of that happened. And I was back in college. A little worse for wear, physically, with a TBI that lasted, it took me two years to get rid of the headache. So now I'm there, and I'm in Act One. I'm in the inciting incident that I didn't plan. Life just threw at me. And who's the welcoming committee? San Francisco State University, in my case. That's what we are. You know, we talk a lot about pathways. I, I think we should start talking about landing pads, you know? Because this is, this is hard. The, People come here in transition. You know, Alan and I were talking a little bit before about retirement, and that's where I am now. I'm just like our students. I'm in a landing pad, pad mode. I am about to shift into the inciting incident, which is retirement. And how am I going to land? What will I do? 
I've got to say, I've spent my life loving older people. Tracy and I share this, a love for older people. And you know, if you're young, whatever age you are, find an older friend, because you're not going to know how to get old unless you watch somebody do it well. And you can watch people do it really poorly and learn from that too. <laughs> right? If you're grumpy now, you will be really grumpy when you're old, because <laughs> you are practicing and you have years and decades of practicing that. Right? So, so act one, inciting incident. And then there's all the middle part. And I'm probably, yeah, I see I'm never going to get through all this. So I want to tell you a couple of stories about students. Uh, oh, hi, thank you. Thank you, I needed that. Yes, thank you. Which story to tell first? I'm going to tell you the mosquito story. I was still in California teaching, and I had a student was an English major, something we almost never get in community college, right? I'm teaching community college. I think I've had five in my entire 30-year career teaching at community colleges, five English majors. <laughs> and so we were talking after class, and he, he said, you know, I haven't always been an English major. I was a really good student. I said, really? I said, what were you before that? He said, well, Truthfully, I only know what my parents tell me. He was, in California, there's a lot of trails for, that they built for horses, and now all the mountain bikes go up there. He was a mountain bike rider, up in the dirt all the time, loved it. And then he was bit by a mosquito. Right? That's not in your five year plan. He was in a coma for a year with encephalitis. And when he woke up, he had no memory of his life. He had all of his skills. He could read and do all those things. But he didn't have any memory of his life story. And he said his parents told him that he had been a science major. I have to say I relate to that. And I, I was never a science major. but. The arts are where everybody goes to heal. It's where the stories are. It's where the expression of our emotions and our life experience happens, whether it's in music or visual arts or theater. You know, when I was a shy kid, one of the things I did, I used to watch the theater students. I'd kind of stand behind and I'd watch them up there. Oh, it's, that's where the healing is. That's people come here often for the arts. And is it a pathway? It's a pathway to healing. I tell students, I don't give a lot of advice to students. Sometimes they ask me and I say, well, be sure and floss because in their 40s, your teeth, your teeth are gonna break. It's gonna cost you a fortune and it really hurts, you know, to get them fixed. <laughs> but what advice do I have? I say, you know, life is both long and short. And you, everybody's telling you what to do. You know that about our students. Everybody's telling them what to do. And I say, well, if you love something, minor in it. If you have to be practical, OK, get your, your master's or your, your major in business if you need to. But minor in music, maybe you can work in the music industry. Because you're going to need the passion that you have for the part of life that is so long. We can't just sprint through all the things we need to do because it's practical. Something has to drive our hearts. So for me, that was certainly true. I went to San Francisco State and studied creative writing. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I would be a teacher, ever. It amazes me right now that I'm here. <laughs> I hated the educational system. I didn't just dislike it, I hated it. Looking back, I realized how many other students hated it. They didn't go through it the same way I did. They went on drugs, and they dropped out, and they did other things, because they hated it, because there was something missing. And I think sometimes that, that something is the arts, the piece of us that finds our story, that finds our expression. And you know what? If you can tell a good story, you can do almost anything. 
You can organize almost anything if you understand Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Because all of life, all of science is that. Everything from the big story of your life from birth to death has Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And the day has Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Science is like that in terms of fractals. We can see the universe. Thoreau said this. To truly see a leaf, you can see all of spring, if you could truly see it. And in the fractal, you see all of those patterns that expand into everything, the whole universe, in ways. So that our job is not to tell people what to do with their lives. Here, go take that road over there. It's to open our students and ourselves, because we are a community of learners open to all, to wonder. It is wonder that is our business. It is wonder and curiosity that saves our lives. You know, I often tell students that sometimes I think book, that, that life is like a book, and it's a book I'm really not sure I like. <laughs> but I keep turning the page to see if I'm going to like the next page. Because <laughs> you just don't know. It's the wonder, the curiosity about what's next. The inciting incident for all of us it takes us somewhere new. And we don't know. We can sit down and be very practical and make a list. But then a mosquito is going to bite us. Because life is filled with surprises and insults and joy. And the only thing that gets us through is each other in sharing wonder and curiosity. So <clears throat> that's one story, this mosquito story. And I, I, I say that because we talk so much about pathways. And I think we need to think about we are not a university. We are a landing pad for all sorts of people that have a lot of damage in their life many times. Um, you know, our culture is a mess, if you haven't noticed. Not just the violence, just the despair, the, the, the homeless, the drugs, all of it. And if we don't take more time to hear each other's stories, to connect, and to tell those stories through art and through relationships, then we're just going to really get worse. The whole culture is going to devolve into something none of us want to experience. And we're close already in many ways to that. So another story, because I'm going to run out of time. Um, and this, I, I'll tell, try to tell this one short. I'm going to sit down for a second. One of the best storytellers ever, 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 I got to see at the Black Storytelling Festival in Oakland in 1980-something, Jackie Torrance. Oh my god. She walked out. She sat down. She never moved. And the entire Masonic Hall looking at her was like mesmerized. So hopefully I can do a little of that. I'll channel. Jackie. By the way, Jackie, I love her story. She was a storyteller for sure. She told stories and lived basically on a Greyhound bus. She traveled 310 days a year telling stories. She literally lived on a bus. Best storyteller I ever heard. Um, she loved ghost stories. So this is a story some of you know. I, I had a mythology class years ago. I, I took a break from mythology for about 10 years because it was like so stressful. Um, mythology classes tend to get more women. Since video games, we get more guys in those classes than we used to. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. But I had two guys. It was a night class, three-hour night class, and <clears throat> or two and a half hour, whatever it was, two nights a week. And the two guys were brothers, and they were probably 30, 40-ish, right in there, the older brother. And I had some students I'd had in other classes before. And one of them, and, you know, mythology classes can be a lot of fun. But these two guys, everything had a sexual innuendo to it, everything. And they were always, like, you know, saying something. And one of the students I'd had before came to me after class. She said, these guys are just awful. And 
I thought a minute, and this is, this is, this, uh, this is not going to give you a rule to live by. This is going to give you how hard it is to be a teacher sometimes, to know what the right thing is to do. And she said, you know, these guys are just awful, and she wanted me to talk to them. And I looked at her, and I said, you need to say something in class to them. Now, this proceeded on through the eight weeks into the quarter, and it wasn't just her. I think just about every woman in the class, except for maybe two, came to me and said the same thing. And I just kept thinking, and I kept saying, you need to say something in class to them. Now, the first woman who came to me, I'd had in another class, and she, I knew this because I took the time to talk to her, which we all need more of that, to be with each other. She left North Dakota uh, on a Greyhound bus, leaving an abusive husband behind. She left on a Greyhound bus with $20 and her daughter and came here. So it was particularly hard for me to see her struggle with these two men. And I got to week eight, and I thought, boy, I've made a mistake. Nobody's saying anything, and I shouldn't have let this go on. Part of this is, you know, I went to Mills College for Women as a grad student, and that changes you. I truly miss Kelly Brooks, by the way, for those of you who remember Kelly. I truly miss her. I was on hiring committees with her, and we saw things nobody else saw. And that's because when you're in a different situation, you learn to see things differently. So going to a women's college changed how I saw things. And I just wanted to empower them, not to rescue them. The second to the last class, the second to the last week, they made some comment. We are talking about heroes, and they made some comment about Schwarzenegger's a real hero. He nailed a Kennedy. Yeah. The person sitting next, the woman sitting next to the guy that said, the brother that said this, and the other one's laughing, went ballistic. And the floodgates opened. And every woman in this, the class just started unloading all of what they had felt and experienced with these two brothers. And I just sat back. And at one point, the older brother, I could, he, he wanted me to rescue them. He said, aren't you going to say it? And I said, no, I've been hearing this all quarter. <laughs> <laughs> And there was a, the youngest woman in the class who had not said anything. And I turned to her after everybody had pretty much said anything. I said, is there anything you wanted to say? And she said, you know, really, I just thought that they're unteachable and they're just not worth talking to. The younger brother, this hit home to him in a way nothing else that had been said did. He said, you mean I'm not even worth insulting? And she's like, so the day, that night, that quarter, I don't know how much mythology we learned, but it changed every woman in the class, and it changed one of the two brothers. The other one never, but you know, he thought I was terrible. But what do you do when you're a teacher? You know, how, what is the lesson? How do you know? How do you identify it? The student that I'd had before went on and may have been Alan, might have been your student. She became a social worker advocating for other women. So it's hard to know. It's just hard to know. Um, I'm, I think I'm running out of time here. So I, there's, and I wanted to go back a little bit to the dyslexia and then tell you one story at the end about a student. <clears throat> when I was at San Francisco State, I was 30 when the, the car accident happened. And it was a drunk driver and total both cars. Um, but fortunately, he was driving a company car, and I got enough money from that accident to pay for my education. So, and that's what I, I could have bought a house with it, you know, like a condo, a little condo back then. But <clears throat> I thought, I want to invest in me. I want to invest in me. So I went back to school. And so my last year at San Francisco State, so I could have gone to Berkeley. I lived in Berkeley at that point. 
Uh, but the average age was like 18 or 19 at Berkeley. The average age at San Francisco State was 27. And I was 30, and I thought, I'm going to go over here. And it was a great choice, just a great choice. I'll give you an idea. One of the sociology teachers at San Francisco State then was Angela Davis. College should be an experience. It shouldn't just be generic, homogenized. It should be an experience right, that we can respond to, and it changes us. Um, but they had a program there where they tested you for learning disabilities. So I, I went in, I thought, hey, this is free. I better do it before I leave this place. And I was just curious at this point. Um, so I took all of these tests, and they literally tested me for over three days. I know I was in that one room for three days. Yeah. And, these were, they, and they were known for being really good at testing older students, because you kind of learn to trick the system as you get older. And so in the end, they, I would, they would give me puzzles and all sorts of things to do. And they always kind of looked shocked and surprised and astonished. You know, like one, an example of that. They gave me a puzzle that was really simple, and it took me a long time to do it. And then they gave me a hard one, and it was really fast doing that one. <laughs> and they literally stopped, and they said, ha, ha, what? <laughs> I said, well, I was learning from the first one. I was getting my head around the puzzle idea, and then, that, and then it was easier. And so, and how, how many miles is this and that? And I, my math skills were, you know, peculiar. I, I just guessed it, and I assumed certain things and guessed certain things. And I ended up showing that I was dyslexic and that I have an auditory processing problem. I don't even know what it's called, really. But if you stand behind me and pronounce certain words that, stand, that sound alike, like, I still can't hear the difference. A pen and one of the pen that you stick in your that in when you sew, I have no idea what the difference between those two sounds are. Can't understand it. And so it made learning uh, language is pretty hard. You know, world languages, we call them now. They said, no, yeah, because I wanted to learn French. She said, no, you're going to have to move to France to do that. OK. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> I had a friend. I'll go visit. <laughs> but then they put me in a study at UC Berkeley because what they found was my intelligence level was really high. And so, uh-huh, yeah. So the slow learner now is like at UC Berkeley getting tested for intelligence. And I got to tell you, this taught me something. Everything teaches us. That it is hubris to think that we can measure people. I don't, I, I rarely, rarely, and Tracy will attest to this, I rarely use the word stupid. I, I don't think people are stupid. I think they're disconnected and, or dis, not engaged or something that I don't understand. I have a friend who couldn't make it through school, but Lord, he could make fish rise in the water. He is, he's a trout fish guide. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I, it's hubris. So we as teachers have to live in that state of wonder about every person that walks through the door, about every colleague that does something differently than you do. Um, you know, I, I don't need people to be a bad version of me, and I don't want to be a bad version of you. So let's, the answer to life's problems is not, and I tell students this a lot, it is not conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican. It's imagination, creativity. We have big problems. We need a, people with creative minds. That's the only way we're going to get out of some of these messes. So. So after that, you know, I community college and I was his student teacher. But after that, I, I got hired at that school to teach part time. And so this here I am in this class and I'm handing back the paper and I've read this paper and I think, you know, you know how you read papers sometimes and you know the punctuation's not all right or whatever, but you go, that's a thinking person. That's a thinking person. And so I, I handed it back to him and he said like this. I said, you know, you're really smart. And his head lifted up and his eyes connected to mine. And every day after that, in our five day a week class or whatever, three days a week class, because it was semester, he stayed after class and just talked to me about this, talked to me about that. And one, one was um, a guy Maybe not unlike Raymond, 
you know. He, he had t the tattoos, and he told me that he had children, that his wife was black, and that his kids were multiracial. And, but he just got better and better. He took me into the next semester composition class, and we would talk, and he was always so respectful, always so happy, in a way, to just be there. Um, because he was seen. You know, we don't see people. We need time. He always breaks my heart. He, the last couple of weeks of school, in the second semester, he came to me and he said, I may not ever see you again. I said, well, why? He said, because I have to go to court. I was arrested, and I have to go to court. And if they convict me of shoplifting, he said, I went to a store, I took some stuff back, I had my kids with me, and they wouldn't take it back. And he thought it was because he was, you know, he was one with his half black kids or whatever. And, and he said, and I have an anger problem. And I got mad, and I raced out of there. Yeah, he did get mad. And I raced out of there, and I forgot that I had the clothes that I wanted to exchange. And so they arrested me for shoplifting. And they're going to send me to prison, and if they do, it'll be my third strike, and I will never get out of prison. This was 1996, or no, it might have been 1994. <coughs> I never saw him again. We can't afford to lose people. It takes so little to get people to raise their heads. We have that. What a great job this is. What a great job. What a great job. So, we need time. I, I want to say one thing and a t more, and somewhat direct. I direct this at everybody. I don't want to direct it just at the administration folks, but because I think everybody's, I don't know, guilty of it or whatever. Systems, whether they're business systems or educational systems, can crush people. And they can crush the people who work here. They can also distract us from our work. Our work is people. Our work is people. It's each other and it's our students. It is not the system. We have to have a system. I, as much as I, you know, Tracy says I'm an iconoclastic and I, I rail against systems all the time, but I, I am not an anarchist. I know we need systems. I'm a structuralist. I'm a poet. I love structure. I think structure actually is ancient. It's not Western, it's ancient. It's just evolved into something that looks Western. We stole it from our own bodies and our own minds. We, we live in stories and act one, act two, act three, choruses. It all comes from the way our minds work, our bodies work. But we have to be more elegant in our systems so that we don't crush everything and everyone, and so that we have time for each other and for those blessed people landing on this landing pad that we are in Act One. So thank you for 25 years.